Hey everyone, just a reminder this is a mental health podcast, so some content discussed may be triggering for some. If you're not feeling up to it, hit pause and come back another day, we're not going anywhere. If it is an emergency, please don't hesitate to contact Lifeline on 13 11 14, that is a 24 hour service. Thank you. This episode of Turn Up The Talk is brought to you by Doers On The Beach and the Corvelli Hotel. Turn up the talk podcast, tackling mental health together. G'day guys and welcome to another episode of Turn Up the Talk. You're joined by Pat Clifton, Lockie Jim Morris and Luke Amredi. And today we're joined by Jess Hoskins, AFL women's player. Jess, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. It's a little bit... Um, interesting in the times at the moment, but going okay. So you're in Melbourne at the moment, which is a bit of a difficult <laughs> time through lockdown. Talk us, to, talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm living in the shunned state at the moment. So hmm. um, Melbourne, we're in lockdown um, in the middle of the six-week lockdown. So stage four at the moment. Um, it's, it's keeping us on a curfew. So we've got to be inside by 8 p.m., um, and we're only allowed outside for an hour. So it's a little bit trying times in Melbourne at the moment, but we're getting through. What are you doing in an hour? Um, I try and go either for a walk or a run, but I mean, you cut off with half the stuff that you want to do, I guess. Yeah, wow, that's not good, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so training, training wise, how are you managing with, with obviously you, you can't play at the moment? How are they managing? Are you training as a team? Is that possible? Or are you just doing your own stuff? Uh, we're all limited to, obviously, everyone's living in different parts of Melbourne. So we've also got a 5K radius at the moment. So we're not allowed to leave any further than 5K away from our house. So it means that all the training and stuff, um, we've moved to online sessions. And our online sessions, we'll take them down to the park. And then we've got like a running program or skills program. Um, I guess I'm a little bit lucky in that I've got my twin sister that um, I can have a kick with. But other than that, I know um, one of the girls actually got a fine the other day for having a kick in the park with a friend. So um, it's not really classified as essential, um, essential fitness, I guess. But I think we're actually getting work permits to be able to have a kick, a kick for the footy. So it's a little bit strange. Have, um, have your club been in contact with you just about like how you're doing? Like, are they keeping in, in contact with the players in terms of like the mental health side? Yeah, yeah. We, um, we've turned to weekly coffee catch-ups online. So <laughs> we're trying to do the best that we can at the moment. Um, we just got two new recruits as well, Elisa Day and Maddie Guerin. Um, so we tried to have a coffee catch-up on the Saturday morning with everyone online and uh, kind of turned everything virtual so they they are really good they've given us helplines if we need and we've got staff at the club um, that are kind of consistently reaching out to us just to make sure that we're keeping on track and making sure that we're all right too are you oh, sorry i'm not sure what it was uh, have you played <laughs> NFL your whole life growing up is it something you've you've done as a young child or you kind of progressed when you were older how's it kind of worked your sporting history um, when I was younger, I used to play pretty much anything and everything you could think of and going through school, got the chance to play whatever I wanted to try. Um, AFL, unfortunately, when I was a kid, it wasn't really around for girls. So, um, I, I remember going down to a training session of Auskick or the, I think it was under 14 boys footy and asked if I could join in. They let me ha- come to training and then I said, can I start playing with you guys? And Unfortunately, they said, oh, you can't, like, girls just can't play with us at the moment just for the rules. So I was all right with it because, I, again, I was playing pretty much every other sport you could think of. Um, but netball was my main sport. I was playing VNL or in the Vic Netball League um, until 2016. And it wasn't until 2016 that I swapped over to footy. Um, me and my sister did a, a NAB talent search day, which was from a Facebook tagged post that one of our teachers tagged us in um, and we ended up going along to this talent search day and then from there we got told to go down to VFL 
played half a season of VFL and then got picked up in one of the exhibition games for Melbourne um, playing against Brisbane. Wow. And you mentioned growing up, AFL wasn't, wasn't there in the women's sense of sport. And I guess that was the case for a lot of sports. What's it like? Do you ever just sit back and think how much it's come along, especially women's sport, not just AFL, but you see there's rib, women's rugby league comps now, rugby union. You must be pretty proud to be a part of that movement. Yeah, I, I love seeing it. I mean, being a massive sports person myself, not only footy, but I'll watch anything, whether it's men's or women's sports, both. Like I just love watching it. And to know, um, I guess when I was a kid growing up, my idols were Nick Rewalt, Lenny Hayes and Robert Harvey. So I turned to that and they, like, in no sense, did I really know any female athletes growing up as a kid. And I think, um, I guess the only one I could think of that springs to mind is Kathy Freeman. But um, in a sense, the athletics was a well-known for both um, male and female um, participants in team sports. Um, female athletes weren't really around growing up. So it's nice to see now. And, and like you said, I do kind of sit back. And I think one of the biggest things for me was watching one of our games um, or going along to some of the games and you see the kids with your number on the, on their back. And that was the biggest thing for me. I saw a kid run up and they asked me for their signature or for my signature and they've turned around and they have my number on their back and I was just baffled. Like That's awesome. it's not something it's not something that was kind of normal to me. So I kind of had a little giggle to myself, but it was a real surreal moment too. What do you, so obviously that's pretty cool. I mean, you're the role model when in women's sport that you didn't have growing up in terms of AFL. What's the feedback been like from young girls? I mean, especially with AFLW, are they absolutely loving it? Do they get the chance to show their skills? Absolutely loving it. And I think across the board, I've been able to go down to a lot of community clubs as well and seeing the difference um, and how many female teams there are now. A lot of the junior girls teams, there's more junior girls teams than there are junior boys teams at some of these community clubs. So it's it's cool to see all the kids just want to give it a go. And I think because of the uproar of AFLW and um, how big it has been in the first four seasons, it's shown across the community level to see how many young kids are getting involved. Yeah, that is awesome. We, obviously being a mental health podcast, I saw a post of yours on the Instagram page, It's Okay Not To Be Okay. And you, you, you spoke about growing up, you weren't really happy with your image as a person. Can you kind of touch on, on that, what that means and your experiences with mental health growing up up until now? Yeah, it's a tough one because it wasn't until I hit, um, uh, would have been in my first season, um, I got asked to write a little article and the article I thought was going to be about footy or something along those lines. And it, it ended up being a lifestyle part in the Herald Sun magazine. Um, and it was more on my image. And um, growing up, I was born with a cleft lip and palate. So for those that don't know what that is, I was born with a hole in my lip and it went through to the back of the roof of my mouth. So it was a hole pretty much the whole way through. It was about the size of my pinky. So that part was gone. Um, I had my first surgery when I was three months old and I had my last surgery last year and across that time I've had 20 surgeries. So um, a lot of those were growing up as a teenager or a young adult um, and as you could imagine, um, a lot of the hormones and everything going through everyone's body at that age and um, I guess you just want to fit in when you are young and, and sometimes you don't understand, I guess, the level of what saying something to someone, the impact that that can have. Um, and so I, um, yeah, I guess one of the stories growing up, a lot of my um, nose was, I guess, on a diagonal slant and you could see the scar on my lip. Um, but I had a random, a random call from someone, didn't know the person, found out who they were, um, but they called me randomly and um, pretty much just told me to kill myself because of the way I was looking. Um, and so that was to the extent of some of the bullying and stuff growing up. And I, I just remember crying in my room for days 
Um, we went on a family holiday three days later and I was still beside myself and my brother found out and my sister found out and they pretended to be the police calling Telstra to find out who this person was, found out who it was and I just said, don't do anything. I just don't, I don't want anyone to know and I think it, it wasn't until football knowing the impact of being able to talk about those experiences and the, some of those bullying experiences and how, um, I guess, sharing my story can help other people as well. With the role of social media in this day and age, you mentioned growing up, you suffered from bullying and things like that. Now we spoke to uh, a guy from Man Anchor, which is a company, and he spoke about the role of social media in the fact of when he was growing up, you'd say you'd get bullied at school, which is terrible, but you'd come home and you could escape it. And now social media, there's, there's kind of no way to escape it, if that makes sense. And social media is great, but it can also have that negative effect. How do you think it impacts people in the side of mental health? I think there's good and bad things for it. Um, I mean, you see a lot of these um, reshare posts and that sort of thing to create awareness around that sort of stuff. Um, but then again, you've got the flip side of you can have keyboard warriors behind a phone or behind their laptop bullying someone and they'll never be um i guess responsible for it and there's no repercussions for what you can say online um so i think calling it out is one of the biggest things and it, i mean i if i see something i'll try and tell someone the impacts that it can have on what they're saying even though that person might go home one night and think they've just messaged someone have no repercussions from it that other person is in their bed crying for three days straight. So I think it has a massive impact on mental health, but the more that we can share these stories and um, share these posts about the positive sides of it and um, positive sharing with social media and understanding what the impact can have, um, I think it may end up outweighing. I mean, social media is never going to disappear at this rate. What advice would you give for a young girl or guy who is struggling themselves with their image? Um, I think talking about it um, is massive and it's sometimes the hardest thing you can do. Um, I know for myself, the hardest thing growing up, I had a twin sister that I was being compared to and my twin sister wasn't born with a cleft lip and palate. Um, so I had that comparison on a day-to-day -day -day basis um, and then I just thought my parents didn't understand and my brother and sister didn't understand to the extent of not knowing what I was going through. So all I wanted growing up was to know someone else that was going through something that I was going through. So if you touch on that social media side of things, you can see other people that are going through what you're going through um, and not even, I think, the stuff that you guys are doing, the podcast that you guys are doing can really resonate with people. So I think talk about it, find a friend or anyone for comfort that you can talk it about or talk about things with. Um, and if you can't do that, try and find someone or something that you can resonate to listening to these sort of podcasts, um, looking at sort of posts of people. And finally, you might end up um, accepting what's going on as well. So with, um, obviously mental health is a big part of like the, every sport now, what, before COVID, what was the club doing with you guys? So say like a lot of people, especially young, young guys, young girls, like they have a bad game, they can turn into a couple of bad games, a couple bad months. I mean, what, in terms of form and in terms of training and stuff like that, is there certain measures in place for your mental health that you guys go through? Yeah, we do. We do a daily wellness as well. Um, so that's something that we plug in how we're feeling. If there's anything, if we're feeling a little bit down, it might be, we might have no reason for it, but we just are feeling down on that day. Um, we've also got a full-time um, wellbeing um, lady that, that looks after us. So um, she's constantly in, in contact. And like I said before, over COVID, we've had, um, all the coffee catch-ups and that sort of stuff. But beforehand, she was catching up with most of the players just to make sure that we're okay. Um, and 
And if anyone was kind of down or anything, we had other support measures as well. If we needed to go see someone, we've got the AFL Players Group. Um, they've got plenty of support networks um, and all the mental health outlets for us as well. So um, it's definitely taken very seriously and obviously being um, in the limelight with a lot of media and that sort of stuff, a lot of players can suffer from mental health through um, being exposed to that side of it. So there are plenty of outlets for us and um, we're constantly brought up in meetings and that sort of thing as to where we can go. Do you think the daily sort of the worksheet that you said, the daily wellness, has that gone a long way to normalizing it for you guys? Yeah, I definitely think, um, I know that there was a couple of sessions for me that I was just flat as last year. I couldn't really work out why. And having the daily wellness was something that we were able to look over a month period and, realize where I was spiking or where I wasn't and for me I realized um, there was a point that I stopped working and (laughs) this is going to sound really bad but uh, there was a point I stopped working and I was spending all my time at home and then going to football and I was almost down about going to football because it was taking me away from relaxing and being at home and now I've been gifted with six weeks of it but (laughs) Um, yeah, it's it's just something that I think they're trying to pinpoint different, um, I guess, different avenues of realising spikes in mental health. And, and in that um, instance, for me, they were able to pinpoint, I was able to have a conversation. And then we, over maybe five catch-ups, we worked out that it was actually just because I was spending all my free time at home and I needed to go do something else to then want to go to football. So it's, we were able to work out why I was feeling a little bit down. And I think that's another thing. A lot of people just don't know why they're feeling the way they are. And that's okay. 100% that's okay. And it's, it's completely normal. I think it's crazy. You just spoke about um, keyboard warriors and we're talking about the mental side of things of being an athlete. I saw a post yesterday. I can't remember the, the player's name. He was from the Lions, I think. And he said... Jonathan Brown about the multis Jonathan Brown and he said us AFL players we don't care if we ruin your five oh minutes. Mitch Robinson <laughs> Mitch Robinson I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan He's Brown been... retired 10 years ago <laughs> 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 sorry back to what I was saying <laughs> and he um, I'm a Sydney Swans man myself so and um, he he said he's been he's had death threats and he's been told to go kill himself for not getting enough disposals because it ruined one guy's multi and to, you yeah. know, to think, yeah, you might have a few beers and you think it's funny to just message this guy. No, he probably won't see it. But at the end of the day, that normal people are doing a normal job, just like yourself. And I think sometimes people go away from the fact and think that they're almost not invincible, but just different because they're on a, they're on that higher level of, of competitive competitiveness. And they should almost understand the criticism, which I don't think is fair at all. But that, did you see that post? Yeah. It was crazy. Right. And oh, yeah, it's ridiculous. Think I think that it's just, it's one of those things that we are human and they are human. And just because it's on TV doesn't mean it's fake. And I think that's where it comes into it is that they're, they're seen as these elite people that are playing this elite sport on TV. And I think sometimes people do forget that they are human as well. They do have raw emotions and, and sending death threats just because they lost you a little bit of money. Like if you're willing to put that money on, it's not their fault. And yeah. I, it's just it's crazy to think that someone could send a death threat for that. Yeah, honestly, I, I don't think when people send it, they go, oh, you know, they won't see it. But I think it's quite... Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, just three tips to people that are struggling or, you know, are going through the same thing. Um, I think... Number one, it's okay to feel the way that you're feeling. Mm. Um, a lot of feeling down, you'll, you'll end up kicking yourself again just because you're feeling upset. Yeah. Um, number two, talking about it, it can actually make one of the biggest differences because you might feel a weight off your shoulders. Or if you do need that help, that other person that you are going to can help you as well. Number three, um, 
I think more so to pinpoint um, other people if they are bullying or that sort of thing, it needs to be called out. I think, yeah. um, like you just said before, Mitch Robinson called that person out for sending death threats. I don't think that person's going to send another death threat. Yeah. So, or I hope so anyway. Um, but trying to call those things out and make people understand that it does have an impact on people and a small comment that they think nothing about can actually make a massive difference to someone else. Jess, we know you're really good mates with uh, Taylor Harris. And um, obviously the photo, the photo last year that made sort of shockwaves around the whole country. What was the reaction like in with AFLW and all the players? Um, it was it was crazy because um, it was interesting. For that game, Tay had spoken to um, the photographer and was like, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the big kick this game. You just wait for it." And then um, after the game it was pretty much immediately it went viral on social media. And I think a lot of people don't understand maybe the extent of some of those comments. Um, and a lot of the people that are out there kind of going negative on why Tay got a statue and why it was this big uproar. There was a lot of comments people didn't see and a lot of inboxes people didn't see. And I think um, you turn around, you look at your daughter, your sister, your mum, even your brother, your dad and your son. And you wouldn't want anyone to message them the way that she was spoken to. And I could, I don't know how to say this, but the comments that were there were something that you wouldn't expect to be. It, it was something that would be in a porno feed, if I can say that. But those comments should never come to light, let alone to be on a sporting stage where none of that is even relevant to what it is. Um, and I think for Tay, like it, it just sent ripples through the footy club, through AFLW, through all women in sport, but also men around as well. And that was the amazing thing to see is that there were so many men standing up for what these other guys were saying to Tay. Um, I know Tay's, <laughs> There's a funny one, but talk about social media again. And um, Tay's social media jumped 80,000 people in one night. So um, in in a way to turn something positive, she was able to turn it into a positive. Um, and she was able to hold herself really well and got up and spoke at a press conference without showing any anger or anything to what had happened and managed to turn it into a reason why to stop people bullying and show that this was online bullying. So trying to find a positive in a negative, um, it had a massive impact on everyone. And I think it was the pinnacle to show social media and bullying at its finest. Yeah, for sure. If I can go back to when you were speaking about growing up, you, you always wanted to talk to your, your family about what you were feeling now that you're a lot more open about what you're going through and when you go through things, uh, is your family, your support network, or do you see a counselor or what do you do when you're not feeling the best? Who's the person you go to? Um, I now speak to my family about it. Um, I have seen counselors before and there were times, and this is why I say speaking can be such a big thing because at the time that I wasn't speaking to my family, I seeked a few counselors and I went and saw these counselors and I laid everything out on the table and that was enough for me to just feel a weight off my shoulders and I felt better immediately. So it was one of those things that I just needed to speak about. And for me, um, there was a stage that I was about 13 um, and I knew I wasn't allowed to have one of the surgeries to correct my nose and a few facial features until I was 16. So there was nothing I could do for three years bar wait for this surgery and it's all I wanted to do. So I was seeking, um, looking for cleft groups, looking for other people that had been through the same thing or a similar thing. Um, but now I, I work um, as an ambassador. Well, I don't work. I'm, I'm one of the ambassadors for Cleft Pals, Vic. Um, I also do interclass and um, I now try and be that person for other kids going through um, what I went through and I'm always open to anyone messaging I'll always respond and 
um, yeah, I, I think my family are one of my main supports. I speak to friends about it, um, but I'm also open to seeing counsellors as well. What's coming up? What's planned? What's the next month? What's the next few months or what's the next year looking like for the AFLW? Uh, hopefully, so long as coronavirus doesn't affect any of it, um, we go ahead in November to pre-season and um, then our season starts in Feb and we go from Feb through to April um, having our season. So unfortunately for us, we got um, shut down in our finals campaign. Um, we won our first final and then coronavirus kicked in and canned the rest of the season for us. So uh, we're looking forward to next season. We we're in a really good position and we were hoping to get to the grand final. So we're looking at building on where we finished up um, and hopefully going into the grand final next year. What about personal goals for yourself? What are those moving forward? Um, for me, for this year, um, I think I've, I've pinpointed my position down back. Um, I want to get a little bit more physical. I love the chase down tackles and all that sort of stuff. But um, being a small player, I, I want to get a little bit better aerially. Um, I'm also setting myself a goal to take a specky this year. <laughs> hey, big specky. <laughs> yeah, I've got to work on that one though. <laughs> specky, aren't you? Yeah, it's, um, I'm more of a midfield Jess. So I, um, oh, yeah? I get in there, get in the... I think I've ever seen you actually go off the floor. Yeah, yeah get in the dispo... <laughs> love all the disposals and um, all the rucks. It's, it's my go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's all right. I've told, told everyone that if I ever kick a goal... I'll do the worm as my celebration because <laughs> I'm a backline player. I don't get to kick goals. Oh, we'll so if I do, I'm going to make the most of it. <laughs> we'll hold you to it. So is, that, is, it like a, is it similar to a, a sort of soccer thing, Jess, that like all the defenders, so your position over, like they do all the hard work and then all like the goal scorers, they just get all the glory. Is it the same thing? Yep, 100%. 100%. <laughs> Every backline player will say the same thing. They don't get the glory. We do the dirty work and then... Um, the others get to lap it up. Yeah, yeah it's where we're all rugby and we're all playing the forwards as well. We always have the same thing. Forwards do the hard work. <laughs> the back. Hundred percent. <laughs> Jess, would really like to thank you for coming on. I mean, obviously you do have a lot of time in lockdown. <laughs> but like you're training and everything, and, and to come out and speak so openly about your story, we really like to thank you. Um, you have a positive impact on everyone that's going to listen. We know that. So to take your time and speak so openly, not even and our podcast, but just in general, congratulations and all the best with what's coming up. No, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. And I think what you guys are doing is absolutely amazing. Just speaking about all the stuff that you're speaking about um, is getting across to people and it's making a massive difference. Thank so you very thank much. You. And, and good luck. Hopefully um, it, it, COVID doesn't hold on for too much longer and you get back into it and good luck with that grand final. And the spectrum. Yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be watching out for the worm, no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Turn up the talk podcast. Tackling mental health together.